because you were also able to join this uh, this meeting outside f for directly, not via the HMPW. So um, if that is the case, then we have no trace of you, which you may want, but it would be great to hear who's in the room. So just a quick hello in the chat this is always very nice. Subashis, nice to see you. Your your videos and your microphone are turned off as long as you don't contribute directly. Um, but you should all be feel very comfortable using the chat. There are colleagues who monitor the chat to make sure that any questions, comments you may have can be can be picked up during the discussion. And I see we have quite a few people participating from Latin America, and that is really quite, that's really great to see. So while we, Let's get started slowly. I would like to welcome everybody to this webinar, which will discuss what happened last year and continues to happen this year across the world with a sanitation situation that really is quite unprecedented. What does that mean? for accountability to affected people? How can we adapt to this new situation? And how can we include that learning for anticipation um, in the future? This is the topic of this session. We hear six short stories of adaptation and anticipation. Before we start, I would like to ask to go to the next slide, because I'm very happy that we managed to have a bilingual uh, webinar today, or presentation, or, or yeah, let's call it a webinar. It's bilingual. Most people here will speak English. But we have uh, Friar Luciano who will speak Spanish, and we have uh, simultaneous interpretation English Spanish. If you would like to, if you understand both languages fine, you may want to choose to um, to stay out of any of the translation channels. If you are more comfortable in one language than in the other, there is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a, a, a world, a, a globe um, interpretation. That is where you would then choose um, English channel or Spanish channel. And that way you will always hear that language. And if someone speaks in the other language, you will hear the simultaneous interpretation. Keep, keep it off if you're happy in both languages and want to always hear the original. Um, well, the microphones are muted. I believe you don't even have a chance to unmute yourself at this point. So um, please use the chat. If you would like to speak at some point, please raise your, um, your hand. That is in the reactions um, icon also at the very bottom, at the very right of your screen. And there you can raise your hand and someone will spot that. It might not be me, but someone else. And write your questions in the chat. And the um, webinar is being recorded 
it is. It is being recorded. Those are my um, brief housekeeping um, uh, uh, rules or, or uh, notes. And um, if we can move to the next slide. Right. Let's go to the objectives. Just to say, so you know who, who is talking to you right now. My name is Aninia Nadik. I work for Sphere and I, um, and I am simply hosting with great pleasure, by the way, this session today. And the objectives for today are following on from what we already saw in the title of this webinar. I think there are three things we would like to look at today. First of all is to understand a little bit the effects of, a, of this unprecedented situation and challenges. And that's a effect on our, that directly affects our traditional ways to ensure accountability to affect the people. And then to question ourselves, well, how did we have to adapt to this new situation? And what were we able to learn from that? And then thirdly, explore ways to make um, accountability to affect the people more predictable, more solidly ingrained in our organizational ways of working. And that is both ad hoc as we adapt, but also in the long term as we anticipate for future such um, situations and institutionalize AAP more solidly into our organizations. So understanding, questioning from that, and then exploring ways for the future. To me, those were the three broad lines that came out of, um, th that I feel are the objectives of today's session. Next, please. I will introduce every, all the speakers um, individually also, but just to give you here a little bit of an overview, we have six speakers. So we, we will go quite rapidly through um, six short spotlight presentations of how they adapted to the new situation uh, caused by the um, pandemic. We have Friar Luciano from Fraternity International Humanitarian Federation. Um, he's also Sphere Focal Point in Brazil, and he will be speaking in Spanish. We have Laure Venier. She works with Translators Without Borders, based in DRC. We have with us Victor Onama, uh, who works with World Vision International, based in, I believe, Nairobi, but working on Somalia. We have Marie-Francoise Signam, who works for Ground Truth Solutions. Claire Goudsmit, who works for HKI as an auditor. And Samantha Melis, who is a researcher and who works with, um, as, a, as a researcher with uh, the CHS Alliance. The, the very broad way we're going to go forward is that we are now entering into those um, the, the short presentations, six presentations in a row. We will then go into a question answer session between myself as the facilitator and the presenters for about 15 minutes. Everything is approximate here. And then we will open up to questions and comments from the audience, from you all. So please do send us your comments, your questions, your remarks. It'll be very useful, not just for us here, maybe we cannot answer everything, but also to have those on, on, on record. Um, the whole session is 75 minutes. And without further ado, spoke a lot now, I would like to move to our first uh, presenter, who is Fray Luciano. He is the Secret General Sec sorry, Secretary General of Fraternity International Humanitarian Federation, 
FIHF. Among many other tasks, Fray Luciano personally accompanies the Venezuelan humanitarian mission in the state of Roraima in Brazil. And he has other humanitarian and also other humanitarian responses and emergencies. And he liaises often between the humanitarian actors, the local governments and the private sector to implement lasting and dignified solutions for the migrant populations. Um, Fray Luciano, with great pleasure, handing over to you. Thank you. Saludos a todos los participantes. Soy Fray Luciano, Administrador General de la Fraternidad, Federación Humanitaria Internacional, Asociación Civil Sin Fines de Lucro, ubicada en Brasil. Bueno, antes de comenzar, quiero agradecer la oportunidad de poder compartir en este foro las experiencias que hemos tenido como gestores de cinco refugios indígenas en el estado de Roraima, al norte de Brasil, en la frontera con Venezuela, en la respuesta humanitaria debido a la crisis migratoria de ese país. En cuanto a puntos focales de manosfera en Brasil, al igual que puntos focales de la red INE, Educación y Emergencia, en Brasil también, tenemos el privilegio de a la vez trabajar con la formación de los estándares internacionales y así, y también ponérselos en la práctica en nuestra gestión en estos cinco refugios. Bueno, en el contexto de la emergencia sanitaria, hemos encontrado situaciones adicionales más allá de las conocidas dentro de ese escenario, debido a las características intrínsecas y diferenciadas que la población indígena presente dentro de los refugios. Fue así que desde marzo del año pasado, cuando empezaron los primeros casos de COVID-19, hemos fijado la atención en reorganizar los espacios dentro de los refugios que en el caso de la población indígena tiene una característica especial que viven en hamacas una al lado de la otra, lo que genera una tendencia a la aglomeración. Bien, hemos haciendo una transformación en la logística para cambiar de las hamacas a las casitas de Aquinur que provee Aquinur y entonces crear una condición de distanciamiento más favorable dentro de ese contexto. Esto es el resultado del diálogo que hemos buscado desde el principio con lo, el liderazgo de cada refugio para que ellos participen en la toma de conciencia en cuanto a los protocolos sanitarios mínimos, incluso dentro de las condiciones de aglomeración de los refugios inevitables. Los refugios menores tienen cerca de 350 personas, los mayores cerca de 750 personas, siendo que la mitad de esta población está formada por niños y adolescentes, y esto dentro de los criterios de acogida y alojamiento. Con respecto a Bosch, agua, higiene y saneamiento, este tema de acceso al agua, producto de higiene y limpieza, Hicimos los ajustes de logísticas para que en los baños, en los pasillos, en la entrada de los refugios, existiesen las estructuras necesarias para que el lavado de manos y la distribución regular del mínimo necesario de kit de higiene para mantener a los refugios en las mejores condiciones posibles. Pero eso no es fácil manejar un grande, con un gran número de niños en esta condición para que se laven las manos con regularidad y que eviten ponerse las manos en la boca. Entonces, hemos recurrido a reuniones periódicas con la población refugiada, especialmente con las madres y padres, al igual que hemos promovido contenidos informativos sobre los cuidados esenciales, dejándolos bien visibles dentro de los refugios y traduciéndolos para los idiomas indígenas de las dos etnias que están acogidas, los huaraos y los niepas. Y debido a la situación sanitaria, hemos trabajado con ellos en el tema del distanciamiento social, pero algo difícil de cumplirse debido a las inevitables condiciones de convivencia familiar 
que la sociedad indígena manifiesta algo muy fuerte dentro de esta población. Bueno, en cuanto a la salud, cuando empezamos con el proceso de monitoreo y, y evaluación de los síntomas de la COVID-19 para detectar posibles casos que necesitarían aislamiento, ellos percibieron que eso significaría que serían separados de sus miembros familiares y serían reubicados en otro espacio, creado especialmente para ese aislamiento de las personas sintomáticas. Y por esta posible eventual separación, las personas ocultaban los síntomas, lo que creó una situación adicional de monitoreo por parte de los equipos para evitar el peor, es decir, la rápida propagación del virus dentro de los refugios. La operación acogida es la respuesta del gobierno brasileño a esta situación humanitaria y son quienes coordinan las acciones con y entre las agencias. Dicha operación creó un espacio llamado Área de Protección y Cuidados, un hospital de campaña, para recibir tanto a los sintomáticos para testear y monitorear, cuanto a los que estaban confirmados con la COVID-19 para tratamiento. La gran mayoría de los casos resultó en recuperación con muy pocos óbitos, pese a la gran vulnerabilidad de esta población en muchos sentidos. Se buscó adaptar este hospital de campaña con hamacas para que las personas indígenas se sintieran lo más tranquilas y acogidas posible. En el mes de octubre, debido a cuestiones de presupuesto, esa área de protección y cuidado fue desactivada y la atención de salud fue trasladada hacia otro refugio llamado Pricumá, que también tiene área de aislamiento y tratamiento, aunque un poco menor que el espacio que mencioné anteriormente. Ese espacio sigue activo y brinda asistencia tanto a la población indígena refugiada cuanto a los criollos, como son llamados los no indígenas. Hemos trabajado con un aspecto preventivo de la situación desde el principio, confeccionando mascarillas, tapabocas, ¿no? orientando a la población y monitoreando los espacios de convivencia, siendo que lo más difícil es monitorear las actividades de los niños, pues que están jugando y corriendo todo el tiempo, y les resulta más difícil, naturalmente, seguir los protocolos. Bueno, en términos de seguridad alimentaria, Hemos trabajado junto a las agencias encargadas de ese sector para que se hicieran ajustes y atender mejor, en especial a los niños y ancianos de los abrigos, considerando que más allá de lo que reciben a diario de la alimentación, pudiera haber algo de ayuda para que ellos adquirieran lo que sienten necesario para complementar lo que reciben, cocinando libremente en las cocinas comunitarias dentro de los refugios. Bueno, con esta exposición un poco rápida, doy por finalizada mi intervención. Agradezco en nombre de la Fraternidad Federación Humanitaria la oportunidad de poder compartir nuestras experiencias vividas en los refugios indígenas en el estado de Roraima, en Brasil. Y quedo atento para preguntas al final. Gracias. Many thanks, Fray Luciano. Yes, five minutes is very short, but I think you gave us a really rich account of, of uh, what actually happens um, on the ground with, with um, um, displaced populations. I noticed also the importance of trust, that people trust uh, what's happening around them so that they don't need to hide symptoms, but can, can freely come forward if, if, if they don't feel well. And that's a really important element, of course, of accountability as well. I would like to hand over now to Laure Venier, Program Coordinator in the Democratic Republic of Congo for Translators Without Borders. Laure specializes in communication with communities and accountability. She supports responders in DRC so they can really respond to the needs of affected people. And she specifically supports communities to access information, to understand their rights, to access services in preferred languages and channels and formats that they understand. And um, over to you, Laure, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Aninia. Um, buenos dias, uh, good afternoon or good morning to everybody. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit about our experience um, as translators without borders in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, particularly on the Ebola responses. And I think that the, the lessons we learned there about adaptation and anticipation are very important and very pertinent now with the COVID-19 crisis, but also with humanitarian crises in general. Um, so in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, as responders on the end of the 10th Ebola outbreak in the East in 2020, um, we're reflecting on lessons learned. Um, an 11th outbreak hit the Equator region. Um, responders mobilized and sent teams to the west of the country. And we saw that a lot had been learned um, during the previous Ebola responses about the importance of communication with communities and accountability to affected people. Um, adapt adaptations were made. Uh, successful local health communicators speaking local languages were deployed to the region. Uh, however, we did see that there's still work to be done. Risk communication materials are still for the most part in national languages, um, French in particular, and also in Lingala. Um, we saw that local health communicators expressed a need for more support and tools so that they can communicate in more localized languages consistently and effectively and they can support two-way communication with communities. So we see that this is especially important um, when communicating complex technical concepts specifically around health um, and translating these concepts and these, these terms into local languages. Um, as I said, this is the case in public health emergencies, but also in humanitarian responses in general. Um, real accountability does mean effective two-way communication in languages, channels, and formats preferred by affected people. Um, just to give a little bit of background, uh, Equator is a region in the northwest of the DRC. The DRC in general is incredibly linguistically diverse. Um, it's a richness, um, but it can also be a challenge for responders. Uh, different linguistic groups live alongside each other, and it's very common to find neighboring villages, neighboring towns, speaking very different languages. Um, indigenous communities uh, in Ecuador, uh, particularly the Batwa uh, communities, live alongside majority Bantu communities. And in our research and activities, we found that communities were impacted by a lack of information in local languages about Ebola and about other subjects. In general, TWB finds that women uh, the elderly, the most vulnerable, are particularly disadvantaged when information and communication is only facilitated in national or international languages. Um, they're like COVID-19 and the COVID-19 vaccination with Ebola and the new Ebola uh, vaccination. It was often treated and it is often treated with suspicion by some in the community and people we spoke to said that the lack of communication in preferred languages, channels and formats further impacts trust towards the response. Um, so just talking about uh, local languages, um, we saw that written information, including posters, are usually provided in French and sometimes Lingala, but not everyone speaks these languages and not everyone reads and writes. Uh, communities told us that they appreciated the deployment Employment of local health communicators who work with their communities to pass the message. Uh, we saw this in North Kivu and we saw this in Equateur and it was well received. We do find, however, that local health communicators need no more support. Um, they need support through training and the equipment of tools, audiovisual tools um, for communication. Or they are often not medically trained, local health communicators, and some of the concepts that are are being shared are new, they're constantly changing, and they're very difficult to translate into local languages. And this translation needs to be consistent and accurate. So there's more work to be done to make sure that these frontline staff are really receiving support. Um, on the subject of terminology, uh, we find that specific medical terms used in Ebola responses and the COVID response are often used in, in languages like French and English um, and are not consistently translated and explained in other languages. Uh, we saw in the Ebola response um, English words being used in a francophone context, words like swab being rendered into uh, swabby um, in French, which makes very little sense in French and makes even less um, sense in local languages. We find that abbreviations are used. Um, we find that uh, 
when concepts are made clear to health communicators, when tools are given, when translations are offered to health communicators, they, they find it easier to, to translate concepts and to explain them well. Uh, we saw, for example, uh, dehumanizing terms such as suspect case, and we see this used with COVID. Um, in the region we were working in, Equator, they explained this was often understood to mean a witch doctor or a thief, the word suspect being very negative and completely culturally inappropriate and, and not referring to a person um, in, in terms of dignity. Uh, we've seen time and time again that the wrong word can create confusion, miscommunication and mistrust. Um, for language and accountability, uh, language is vital. And at the end of the Ebola outbreak in North Kivu, um, reports of sex sexual exploitation came to light. Um, we see this unfortunately all over um, the region and all over the world. And an issue is survivors not being able, to, not knowing also how to report abuse when it happens and make complaints and get help. We found that there's a lot of, there's a lack of information about what languages services are offered in. Um, there's a lack of mechanisms that people can use in local languages to report and to get information and help. Um, and it's really important to ensure that feedback mechanisms and support to have offered to survivors are accessible to all, including speakers of marginalized languages. Um, thank you very much for the time. I'm worried I've gone over, um, but just to leave you with a, a last sentence, I, I think we can't claim to be accountable to people af affected by crisis if we're unable to communicate with them and them with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Those last words are very important indeed. And um, I, I just came across a, a, a quote that someone just sent me and the quote says, we cannot add value unless we know the existing value. We cannot know the existing value unless communities tell us. People will not tell us unless they trust us and they will not trust us unless we know how to listen and engage. Um, that comes from a PFIM case study um, from 2017, and I think that is a very uh, appropriate quote also for this. For this webinar, we've heard two um, presentations by now, and it's all about trust and communication and listening and understanding. And with this, I am going to um, move to our third, and thank you, Laura. <laughs> Maybe I forgot to say thank you, but thank you for your presentation. And I'm moving over now to Victor Onama. Victor works for World Vision um, International in Somalia. He um, is design monitoring and evaluation manager. He has vast experience in designing, setting up, and strengthening meal systems for developmental and humanitarian programs. And this includes, interesting, a technology-driven platform to enhance community participation and feedback. I would love to hear more about that, but unless it's part of your presentation, Victor, it has to wait for another time. Thank you very much for being with us and over to you, Victor. Yes, thank you and uh, greetings to everyone from different parts of the world. It's my pleasure to share our experience from Somalia. And uh, just to give a quick background, uh, the humanitarian situation in Somalia has remained unpredictable. And uh, this normally presents in different forms. We have climate related shocks, uh, disease outbreaks, but also weak uh, social protection mechanisms. In 2021 alone, we experienced uh, a number of crises. Uh, we had the cyclone, also the desert locust infestation, but again, the COVID-19 that actually affected the whole world. And so in light of this, you find uh, the chances of compromising the humanitarian accountability standards. And uh, just to highlight that uh, uh, prior to the COVID pandemic, uh, the community engagement and accountability working group in Somalia had actually done a landscape analysis of uh, the accountability systems across different organizations in Somalia. 
So one of the key recommendations from this analysis was for different organizations to strengthen their accountability systems and ensure that the systems are able to adapt in case of uh, uh, any changes that come in the accountability uh, implementation process. And uh, as World Vision, we also conducted uh, uh, core humanitarian um, standards assessment. And in this assessment, we also identified the need to strengthen our systems. And so our system has continued to evolve uh, from the manual processes. Now we have an automated system which basically we also worked to develop together with uh, other partners. And in particular, we developed what we call the community response map, uh, which uh, basically helps uh, in two-way communication between the beneficiaries and World Vision. And so this platform, we worked on it together with uh, the IOM team, uh, the communications department uh, from Geneva, but we also developed what we call the interactive voice response system, uh, basically to ensure that we're able to hear from the beneficiaries and respond to their needs uh, on a timely basis. And so when COVID came, it necessitated that we, we had to adapt quickly because we saw that it was not possible to uh, visit the project locations and people were required to practice physical distancing. And so we had to look at uh, adaptation measures around issues of information provision, community consultation, and also feedback and compliance mechanisms. So in terms of uh, information provision, we had to uh, strengthen the capacity of the community structures, and particularly the faith leaders, basically to provide the required information about different project activities on accountability systems, but also uh, information about uh, COVID preventive measures. And we also had to leverage on our community response map platform and IVR system uh, to broadcast messages to beneficiaries about uh, the different um, project activities, uh, the accountability system, then also protection against uh, sexual exploitation and abuse. And uh, in terms of community consultation and participation, we also continue to closely work with the community structures, the faith leaders, the volunteers, to ensure that we remain in touch with the community members. And again, using the same uh, platform that we developed, we were able to conduct online assessments, basically to hear from the community members on the different channels they would prefer for us to use for providing information but also for the community members to provide feedback to World Vision. And so we had to adopt uh, the, 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 the system that we had developed. And then uh, in terms of uh, the feedback and compliance mechanisms, we also had to use the already existing platform, basically to come up with new innovative ways of doing business. And uh, this ensured that we had a multiple of mechanisms to be able to capture community feedback, uh, also to be able to share information about different project activities and uh, uh, the accountability related issues. Yeah, so um, during COVID, uh, we were able to uh, encourage beneficiaries to re record their feedback. Uh, because the initial system was that uh, you would find beneficiaries had to call, but now the challenge was that even staff, it was difficult for them to go to the office and you know attend to some of these uh, issues that are being raised. Yeah, so with uh, our adaptation measures, we were able to have a remote system where staff even didn't need to go to the office, but just sit from their homes and they're able to listen to the automatically recorded feedback that we're getting from the communities and the staff are able to translate them. And this is assigned to the different staff uh, that are required to handle the issues. And so uh, this really helped a lot in terms of uh, ensuring that we continue to hear from the beneficiaries. Uh, they also continue to provide feedback on the different aspects of our programming. And so in summary, uh, what I can say is that uh, the awareness of the ever-changing context really helped us a lot. And uh, 
World Vision had to look at creating multiple uh, channels for us to be able to continue uh, receiving information from uh, the community, but also uh, responding to them. And uh, our systems basically uh, had to adapt quickly to the changing requirements of COVID-19, ensuring that uh, we remained relevant and provided the necessary opportunity for beneficiaries to be able to uh, provide feedback. Yeah, thank you. Uh, quickly, that is uh, our story of how we managed to uh, adapt during the COVID response. Over to you, Haninia. Haninia, you're muted, uh, but maybe just a question that came up in the chat. Could someone repeat the name of the platform Victor developed, please? Victor. Uh, it's community response map. Community response mark. Okay. Can you put a can you put a, a a link in there? Is that possible, or is it is can it be found? Yeah. So let me do that straight away. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, Gergay, thank you very much, um, and thank you, Victor. Really, now we're moving into this this um, area of remote remoteness and how to keep the contact even though we are no longer um, even though there's this remote factor coming in and um, I'm now um, handing over to uh, Marie-Francoise Sitnam she works for Global Truth Solutions she is senior program manager and leads uh, GTS's programming which combines uh, is very interesting work in case you don't know what they do. It, it combines perception surveys with relevant accountability strengthening projects. And she focuses on uh, Central and Western Africa region. Um, Marie-Francoise, over to you. Thank you for being here. And in case you're speaking, you're muted. Marie-Françoise. Marie? So, while Marie-Françoise, while we sort out the sound issues. Hello. I was oh, there she is. Huge apologies. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Nina. Hello, everyone. Uh, buenos dias, buenas tardes. Uh, my Spanish will stop there in the interest of time. But thank you, everyone, for, for uh, tuning in. Uh, my name is Marie-Françoise Sitnam, um, and I am Senior Program Manager at Grand Truth Solutions. Just as a quick, quick overview of what it is that we do. So Grand Truth Solutions, uh, we tr try and support affected people who are affected by humanitarian crises. Um, in different areas across the world uh, in order to bring their perceptions, their perspectives, their preferences um, to influence implementation and strategies um, at a coordination level so that they can have a say in how programming is implemented. Um, our role is that to be there as a support for coordination teams and humanitarian response uh, actors, as well as um, amplifiers of uh, things that we hear and that we data that we collect from affected groups. Um, I want to just, uh, in the interest of time, I will be looking at different aspects from the various contexts in which uh, we've worked, of which I have done, which are African Republic, Burkina Faso, and Chad. Reason for this is that it is three vastly different contexts, but also that our work there has been um, at different levels. Uh, we have started, for example, in Chad in the past uh, five, three or four or five years uh, together with CHS Alliance. And then um, CAR is, I would say, intermediary. We started in 2019 and Burkina Faso is one of our more recent where we started in 2020. So it would be interesting to look at all those perspectives. In terms of how we've adapted um, and how the COVID-19 crisis has impacted our work, uh, when we look at how GTS functions, we go in and uh, formulate questionnaires and indicators that we will 
be interested in, but as the coordination team also would be interested in, in having more information about the perceptions from affected groups. Uh, and then we develop in the questionnaire, go ahead, collect the data. And then a key aspect of what we do is going back into communities that have been uh, surveyed to give them feedback on what has been collected and share with them what the data has said. This allows us to analyze even further and in our reports to just go more in depth when they're in data that we don't necessarily understand and to also get get recommendations directly from community teams so that the recommendations that are then formulated do not come from GTS, but that come directly from affected groups. Obviously, with, um, with uh, COVID-19, this was very complicated to do because we had limited access and we are already working remotely. We don't necessarily, we aren't necessarily embedded within the countries where we conduct surveys. But in this case, it was even more complicated um, because how do you collect that data if you don't have access uh, to the people? Uh, luckily, in many of the contexts, we were able to adapt. So either we had done co data collection in very early 2020, which was the basis of something that we could use. Uh, but then we started to look at different methods, whether it was re for remote data collection. So whether it was via phone or um, whether it was um, through partners. And in this, I want to emphasize, basically one of the biggest lessons learned for us was the fact that it really needs to, our approach needs to have the buy-in of the coordination team and the humanitarian actors in country for, uh, for perception surveys to actually be effective, especially in the current context, um, as well as having clear understanding of what it is that the end goal is and how it can contribute and, and help um, uh, uplift the, the response as a whole. So that was a, a very key aspect for us moving into that. Uh, and so we were able to rely on the various partnerships, whether old and new in the different contexts, uh, to be able to, for example, rely on partners that were already in the field or that had outlets in the field to um, do the feedback from the data we'd already collected or look for partners who were able to do data collection via, um, via, via phone. Um, it also led us into something that is the mixed method, mixed methods, uh, which we then realized would be key to bring in even after um, COVID-19. Uh, and so in this sense, it was not just focusing on our regular quantitative surveys, which we do for response-wide perception surveys, but coming in and using, for example, qualitative methodologies, which we did in CAR, for example, to explore um, experiences of COVID-19 from the perspective of cash users or cash recipients, pardon me, or vendors and how that impacted them, uh, as well as then doing some very specific key informant interviews around COVID-19 uh, with key informants um, throughout, throughout the response. And having all these different layers enabled us at the end to always be able to cross-reference, triangulate our data, as well as data that we would get from other partners who were collecting uh, data around accountability and perceptions and have something that was much stronger to present um, and much, much fuller to present. Uh, this leads me to, to talk about a very specific uh, lessons learned or case study coming in from work in Central African Republic, where in a lot of the quantitative surveys that we did around the quality of the response, we realized that um, a lot of the, the, the respondents who have had or been a part of cash programming were, were quite positive about aid and humanitarian aid and its delivery, et cetera, compared to other respondents. Um, in parallel to that, because we were in COVID-19, we were hearing not just us, but other partners uh, were also hearing on a recurrent basis that uh, a lot of uh, affected people were saying that, you know, the prices were really exploding and that was really mu very much affecting them uh, in terms of the effects of COVID-19. However, in doing market studies, a lot of partners didn't see that prices were rising to that extent. And so there was a lot of confusion as to, you know, the differences in what the data we were collecting. Being able to have a mixed methodology that focused specifically on cash users, um, we realized that 
the fact that these user, the, the cash recipients or vendors um, had already had so much on their shoulders and it was the compound of all the different um, elements and shocks that they had already gone through uh, combined with this last COVID-19 shock uh, that was bringing people to the brink and which in our eyes as maybe expert on the outside, we were looking at, well, it's just a very, very insignificant, insignificant quote unquote price hike was translated into something that was pushing people really to the brink. And having those mixed methodologies is something that enabled us to see that and to bring that to the attention of the, the, the general uh, coordination team and, uh, and our partners that were working on, on cash. And I think that last week, um, some of our colleagues from OCHA actually mentioned that from that type of data, together with what DTS data and other data that was brought to light, they were able to then go and see with service providers how to include more people in terms of cash programming and better understand the impact of COVID, not on so much on the health side of things because people weren't necessarily worried as worried on that side, but were more so worried when it came to the socioeconomic impact of things. Um, I will just want to um, continue by saying that as a last point, it brought to light really the importance of um, not shying away from all of the AAP initiatives um, and going into initiatives that could be creative, that, that relied on various resources and not just one method for us. I think that the context really um, helped us and pushed us to think outside the box and into areas probably where we weren't necessarily as comfortable because it wasn't as methodical as we would have wanted it to be. But then it opened up other opportunities for us to explore and triangulate different types of data to bring something to the forefront that was actually stronger. Um, and so just the emphasis on the importance of AAP initiatives of this sort and of funding into AAP um, initiatives of, of this type so that we can always tap into these nuances, which are often the details that go overlooked and go unseen, but that is actually where, um, where the, the most of the, the key information is to bring forward. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there unless I can move forward or I have a minute or two. Um, thank you, Marie-Francoise. Uh, let's stop there in the interest of time because Actually, what you uh, have um, have uh, talked about now is really interesting. It really um, it creates the bridge between uh, the previous and the following presentations. I believe uh, you you talk more about the remote uh, programming trust again. How do you how do you tr um, create the trust in a remote way? You talk about mixed methods, which I believe we'll hear about from the next um, speakers as well. And interestingly, you also mentioned that some of those lessons uh, can actually be really useful for the future as well. So not so so there's there's things that organizationally we can actually learn and keep because it makes sense. And you mentioned uh, cash in particular, cash-based programming, which is a which is a, an important area. Um, I would like now to hand over to our next speaker who really follows along quite nicely. Claire Goudsmit is um, senior auditor with HKI. She is also an independent consultant. She has over 20 years of experience in many different humanitarian and developmental contexts and countries. And um, she has been auditing organizations since 2009, first against the HAP standard and now as HKI lead auditor against the core humanitarian standard. And it is in this capacity that we welcome you today, Claire. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about our experience of shifting our work to remote auditing during the COVID travel restrictions of the last year. Um, as many of you may know or may not know, um, HKI audits of organisations performing against the core humanitarian standard rely quite heavily um, as a central component of the audit process, um, gathering feedback from communities and people affected by crisis. We would normally do this by travelling to countries where an organisation works and where it delivers its programmes directly. Um, auditors would travel to communities to consult with them 
quite in depth um, and listen to their opinions, their perceptions and observations of the organization and its work and their engagement in the activities that are being delivered in their communities. So as we couldn't conduct on-site visit of any kind during 2020 and also that will go into the end of this year um, due to the, the travel description restrictions, we obviously had to adapt quite quickly and move all of our planned audits online to remote auditing. To establish communi communications with communities, we worked very closely with the organisations who was being audited with their country teams in country to work out what was the best way to communicate with communities, what was possible to facilitate those consultations in the most appropriate way um, and appropriate to the safety of, of people, um, taking into account all the different restrictions that people had in different locations of how to gather or not. So the auditors selected interviews, um, translators remotely and different contingencies um, of anyone being consulted. So we had multiple different plans, reliant on different communication methods, looking at where it was very likely that connectivity would be very weak or it would break down if IT wasn't available. So we used different methods, you know, WhatsApp, Skype, Zoom, MS Teams, and just normal telephones. Um, so, and also where we would usually meet communities in their home locations, in many cases, community members had to travel to a place where the so just as an example, you know, with everything that we organised um, as best we could, with a click of a button, with the accept call button, we found ourselves staring at each other, um, all a bit startled. And so this was one experience of a group of women in um, Pakistan. And we take about an hour and a half for these calls, and a lot of time was taken up to build a rapport and to ease a lot of the awkwardness that we had around the situation. Um, you know, they've just arrived and, you know, this was me doing an audit suddenly on a screen, trying to have, um, you know, a conversation about accountability. Um, so we spoke and we speak a lot about their opinions, ask about how well organizations are sharing information with them and communicating, especially in these times. Um, if people are included and how they participate in the activities that are being implemented and how able they feel to give feedback to the organization and whether, whether they feel comfortable using the accountability mechanisms that are put in place for them. And so we do get a lot of information, but there's a bit of laughter and after a bit, a few farewells, the screen will just go blank and they disappear and I disappear from, from them. And so whilst we receive a lot of useful information from remote consultations with communities about their experiences and how well an organisations perform. We have experienced a lot of their We had limited um, input into the selection of the communities and the physical setup of the consultations. Some people travelled quite far for the consultations, which was not in the plan, and they sensed that that was a big day out, so it can present a bit of bias and an unreality. Um, and while we met, we adapted methodologies real time, depending on the context and changes um, so that we could use the preferred methods of communi from, for communities for communication. It's very difficult um, uh, through that, those technologies to, to assure privacy um, of the location. And that can maybe make it difficult for people, especially in those situations to feel comfortable enough to, again, trust us and to be able to open up and have um, sometimes difficult conversations. Also, not being on site, we as an auditor don't have any direct observation and we can't use our peripheral auditor vision of the context, the situation, all the dynamics that we usually indicate a lot for us in an audit. So in anticipating the future, we can use some of these though, and we, we anticipate like a hybrid approach where by we go on site still, but also use remote conversations. Um, and we have a lot of experience now to, to do that as best we can. Um, to enable feedback from communities to directly influence and be input into the audit process um, within the HKI audits. So I'm gonna stop there because of time. Um, that was just a snapshot of what we've been doing to um, adapt and do remote auditing. Thank you.
Can't hear you, Anina. Again, apologies. I was thanking Claire. Thank you, Claire, for the, your presentation and just remarking the, the distance that really is felt quite strongly in, in, such, in such remote interviews with communities indeed. Um, I would like to hand over to our last speaker, really last but not least in, this, in the true sense of the meaning. Um, um, I'm welcoming uh, Samantha Melis. Uh, she is a humanitarian researcher and practitioner with a keen interest in the intersection of conflict, disasters, development, and humanitarian studies and practice. Uh, Samantha has worked with the CHS Alliance and she will talk to us about the results of her, of her study. Over to you, Samantha. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me also and for the participants that are still hanging on here. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so yeah, the complaint, complaints and feedback mechanisms play essential roles in helping organizations to be more accountable to the people whom, with whom and for whom we work. Uh, the CHS Alliance and the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague wanted to find out how the COVID crisis actually impacted complaint mechanisms specifically. Uh, almost 80 respondents around the globe participated in an online survey from May to July last year. And we followed up with uh, eight online interviews more in depth as well. The research showed that uh, especially the sudden and extended lockdowns had a great impact on the complaint mechanisms. So while this impact was highly context dependent, um, not knowing the scope, the time, the length and the place of these different restrictions made it very difficult to adapt to the new situation. So in-person contact was broken, the usual complaint boxes were left unattended, uh, and the switch to remote modalities was not easy for uh, organizations who were not prepared to do so. So normally organizations rely heavily on face-to-face -face interactions and awareness raising, uh, such as these feedback sessions or community meetings, uh, but these in-person and face-to-face -face modalities were not always possible. And this became even more problematic as these modalities are often also preferred by both the communities and the organizations alike. A number of organizations related this also to trust uh, and they equated trust primarily to the physical proximity between the organization uh, and, the, and the community. So when movement restrictions were impose, imposed, they actually identified a great risk namely to lose the connection and the relationship with the communities that we are serving. Uh, moreover, marginalized groups also heavily relied on these in-person modalities uh, and therefore COVID negatively impacted their ability to reach out to the organizations. One example highlighted the impact on women for example, in certain contexts uh, who usually do not have access to phones or uh, risk confidentiality when their names are shown on messages or calls. And it seems also in the research that the number of more sensitive complaints also dropped because of this lack of personal contact. Uh, to ensure the accessibility of complaint mechanisms, the organizations were required to actively reach out to these groups uh, and not only rely on hotlines or email addresses, WhatsApp services and Facebook pages um, that some organizations did have in place, and to do this, there was a strong reliance on local partners, on volunteers, on health workers uh, and community leaders to continue these in-person modalities. And there were examples of health workers being involved in home visits or local CRM committees collecting complaints or organizations reaching out to community leaders to ask them about the projects um, and the situation within the community. So on the one hand, this involvement also of local actors provided opportunities to localize accountability mechanisms uh, and increase the access to complaint mechanisms for certain population groups also in the long term. On the other hand, it also concerns sensitive matters and people did not always prefer to share their complaints with someone who is based in the community to, due to privacy reasons and also local power dynamics. And we need to be careful not to just transfer the health risk uh, to local partners in this sense. So to balance 
these uh, in-person modalities with more re remote ones. Uh, some organizations also created a more hybrid approach. So for example, by remotely managing focus groups with a limited number of people would gather, uh, following the health protocols, but then with a direct line with the organization's focal person by phone or, or through the internet. Or having booths with voice recorders where people can actually share their feedback in private and then send, send it to the organization. And these proactive responses proved actually to be crucial in ensuring the accessibility of complaint mechanisms. And this also meant or means that reactive mechanisms that are currently shaping uh, accountability practices should probably be need to be rethought in some way or the other. And it was interesting to see that organizations who usually work in crisis affected area were actually better equipped to adapt to this change as they were already dealing with these type of access issues. The most important takeaway from the impact of the crisis on complaint mechanisms at, on complaint mechanisms in general is that preparedness is crucial to actually be able to better adapt to the new situations. But not only for an organization to have both remote uh, and in-person modalities ready, but also to decide on which channel is actually most appropriate and for each type of situation and crisis. Uh, and, that, and to do that together with the affected people to make sure that um, the channel is also most appropriate and relevant to them. I would like to end there. We can have the, the link also to the report if you would like to have uh, more information on, the, on that as well. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Samantha. Thank you all six panelists for, for your presentations. It's been a very, very rich and diverse um, overview, little spotlights on various aspects of accountability to affected people in a situation of COVID-19 and beyond. We are running, not late, but in such a way that I would like to suggest that we change a bit the agenda in the sense that instead of keeping the conversation among ourselves, I would like to broaden out to the audience. I heard from Gerge that there are a few interesting questions which I would like to bring in now and then um, hopefully time allowing I'd like to ask you to keep your, sh your answers really short. I would also like to suggest that any links to any interesting studies, documents, uh, your websites, whatever, please uh, feel free, panelists, I mean, to put them and audience, to put them in the chat so that you don't just depend on, on the actual airtime you get here, because I understand it's short and maybe um, you know, you have a lot to share. Over to you, Gerge, if I may. Thank you for three questions that we'll bring in now. Thank you, Aninia, and thank you to those who have been contributing questions in the chat. Uh, so I've flagged three questions. Um, the first is for Friar from Lilian Kambirigi. Uh, it is comforting to see no blue tents in clean shelters in Roraima. Um, how could these good practices be extended to Africa refugee camps? That's the first question. Uh, the second question is for Claire from Rosa Argent. Are you able to, and if so, how do you ensure inclusion of persons with disabilities in your consultations? And the third question is for everybody from Rebecca Hetzer. How have organizations been dealing with pandemic fatigue among communities for whom COVID is often a distant threat relative to the many other challenges that they have faced related to health, security, hunger, and livelihoods? So those are three questions. We have some more and we have time to get to those. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Gerge. Uh, Friar Luciano, may I um, hand over to you for answering the first question, which is really something that probably all of you would have something to say about. It's like, how can others learn from your experiences? And here the question is, it's comforting to see no blue tents um, in your response uh, um, situation. How can these best practices be extended to Africa? Over to you, Fray Luciano. Uh, 
Gracias, Aninia. Bueno, es verdad, cada, cada respuesta humanitaria determina, demanda un tipo de, de acción diferente. ¿no? La, la, la situación local es muy importante. Para compartir, nosotros tenemos nuestro portal, nuestra página web, en donde hemos buscado que la comunicación va, va a ser mucho más allá solamente de la visibilidad institucional, sino que un compartir de buenas lecciones, ¿no? lecciones aprendidas realmente, para que podamos realmente colaborar en el desarrollo de soluciones de que todavía contextualizadas, pueden ser utilizadas también en otros locales, ¿no? Entonces, entendemos que la, la comunicación, la fraternidad humanitaria entiende que la comunicación es fundamental para compartir con otros actores, con la gente, a también con la población atendida, para que ellos puedan también recibir todo eso con feedback, siempre con diálogo y reconstruir la situación. Por lo tanto, considero la comunicación en línea como muy importante. Está en el chat nuestra, nuestros links, ¿está bien? En donde hay mucha información. Gracias. Thank you, Fray Luciano. That is really indeed the key, you know, communicating among ourselves, learning from each other, setting up, finding or using existing platforms to learn from each other. Um, thank you for that. Claire, um, how, about, um, how about including persons with disabilities in those remote um, community consultations? Um, That's a challenging one. Yeah. So it's as a general rule for either remote or if we were on site, um, we would always seek to speak to as many people that the organization is working with as possible. And we work with them in country to make those selections and ask for volunteers for the consultations. So yeah, it's, it's facilitating them to make sure that we get a breadth of the, of the different people, be them disabled, marginalized women, men, young people, as we can um, to get a representative sample of the people that they work with for the consultations. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Then there was this question about pandemic fatigue, and I think all of you could speak to that. Um, but I so I have a sense for whom that might be more interesting than others. But I, I just want to open up to all panelists and just say jump in if you would like to respond. This um, this question about pandemic fatigue when people are actually so much more worried about existential survival issues and and um, beyond the health issues, which were mentioned a couple of times today as well. Um, who would like to jump in and answer that one? If I may, Aninia, mm -hmm. uh, um, so that's a great question. And it's something it's a question that we asked ourselves internally as well at Ground Truth Solutions. And and I think that a lot of other partners as well are asking themselves this very same question. For us, we realized that it just couldn't be an only COVID-19 year. It had to be a year with everything else that had already been happening. Um, all of the, the rest of the context that we were already operating in and that affected groups were dealing with, as well as COVID-19. And so within the surveys and collecting people's perceptions, um, what they wanted to share, we made sure that it was not just COVID specific and that it was broad enough so that um, sense that everything else was not being for, forgotten um, for you know the benefit of a, a bigger global agenda but that it was just being taken into account and then analyzed together with everything else as well yeah thank you marie francois for marie francoise i i i think that is a a, a general lesson it's generally something that we've also been discussing in the run-up to this to this uh session is that COVID-19 is one element on top of many, many other vulnerabilities and that that need to be um, accounted for. And so that's also how it should probably be dealt with. Um, no, noting that it is a, a somewhat difficult situation. Um, I would like to ask our Spanish speaking um, friends who check the Spanish um, chat or the chat for Spanish questions, whether you would like to share some of the questions here with the with the panelists now.
That would be Angelica and Tiziani. Sí, Angélica aquí. Angélica, hola. Eh, hay una consulta en relación a, a encuestas que no han comprendido bien. ¿Cuál sería una encuesta de percepción? ¿Cómo se elabora? ¿Qué tener en cuenta? ¿Y qué es una metodología mixta? So I think that that was for myself. Uh, for that would be for you, I guess, and maybe for Claire also. Uh, okay, go for it. Thank oh, you. sorry, sorry. Let, let's let's check first. Um, Angelica, are there other questions as well? Eh, las otras preguntas estaban relacionadas a a Fray Luciano y ya las contestó. Sería la que está en español pendiente es esta. Great, thank you, Angelica. Yeah, Marie Francoise, over to you. Uh, so when we quickly when we speak about um, perception data, we're talking about data that are surveys that don't specifically look at people what people need. So it's not a, a needs evaluation, but really how they feel or how they experience the aid that they have been receiving. Um, and we take into account the different um, themes of, for example, participation, how they've received information, how safe they feel during uh, aid delivery, whether they feel that they have participated, what types of mechanisms are available to them for feedback and complaints, and whether they use them, et cetera, what type of aid they've received. That, those are mainly what we're talking about in terms of perceptions and then uh, going back and then asking for recommendations based on the data that we have um, collected. How do we uh, come up with this data or the, these indicators? We do it with through a collaborative method. We go around and look, talk to the different partners that work in country um, so that we can have their buy-in, whether it would be sector specific or more on a general, general level to ensure that the questionnaire that we're going into uh, the field with is something that, well, that we are going to um, work with is something that is context specific and adapted. Um, so I'll stop there and hand over to Claire, maybe. Claire, would you like to add something? Yeah, go ahead. Can you just repeat the question? Sorry. It, it was, um, what are uh, perception surveys and what are mixed methods? So perception survey, I think that Marie-Francoise oh, has, okay. has, but the mixed method part. Don't worry if you it's fine. If... Yeah, no, it's fine. I think. Okay. Okay. That's cool. Um, thank you all. We are almost at the full hour. We have two more minutes um, according to the, to the clock, which is really mercilessly ticking away. Um, I would like to stop here um, in terms of question answer, noting that there's a lot going on in the chat. Um, I also see some discussion with Samantha around the importance to develop really a, 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 a communication channel with affected populations that can be trusted. And that is a key element that I think just went across every single presentation we've heard today. It's how to build up trust, how to communicate in a safe way and in a, in a trustworthy way. Um, remotely and honestly also in person. So um, my sense is that a lot of what we've heard today is not something that relates um, exclusively to COVID-19. I believe that was also said by some of you. I think that's important to note and that we can, maybe we, we woke up a little bit to, to certain um, accountability questions and we should take the advantage of of, of keeping the focus on this very, very central and uniquely central, maybe the key question of all of how we work. Um, I believe that my colleague Tristan is um, setting up a, um, a survey for you guys at the end, just to hear a little bit whether you enjoyed the session or not. In the meantime, I have the uh, honor and the pleasure to um, say a round of thanks. Very important. So first of all, a huge thanks to all our panelists who all so very well kept to your time and to the to to and 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 yet managed to um, 
to send us such inspiring and awesome um, um, shared so many great experiences with us. I want to thank the audience who were very active in the chat, who were interested, who seemed to um, really be there with us. Thank you very much for making the time. I want to thank Gergay and Angelica and Tiziani as well for having uh, surveyed the chat and asked the and shared the questions with us. A huge thanks to our two interpreters, Maria Laura and Isolda. This is very important work and a, a key aspect also of communicating, as we've heard in languages that we understand. And I would like to um, thank some of the organizers, in particular Anina from HKI, who has um, in, in, in an awesome, with great energy, has pushed us through the organization of this session, which takes so much. Um, I want to thank the Sphere team for setting up the, the Zoom, the everything, the whole technical um, background. And in particular, I would like to thank Wasila, who has really pulled together um, the content of the session. A huge thanks to you. I hope I haven't missed out anyone. Um, thanks to Tristan, who is now also setting up, I believe, a, uh, um, a survey, which I really need to hand over to you, Tristan, to explain this and catch people before they sign off. Thank you all. This will be it from me. It's been a great pleasure. I hope, I think we all learned a lot today and I'm looking forward to seeing you at the next occasion. Thanks. This is the quickest I ever set up a survey. Um, the link is now in the chat. There's just um, four questions. How you rate the webinar, what you liked most, what we can do differently next time. Any other comments? So uh, please, uh, do give us that feedback. We organize quite a few webinars now and your feedback is really important to us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.